are for the Safe Children, Safe Schools community of practice. Um, some of you might have um, been invited to other webinars and noticed that this is now um, part of an ongoing series of webinars. Um, very much based on the interests that the members of the community are expressing um, and, uh, and also in collaboration with some other sister organizations that are sponsoring other webinars. Um, for example, the um, Asia Pacific Coalition for School Safety and the ASEAN School Safety Initiative has a series and um, um, IFRC's Urban um, Programming also has a series. So we, we really um, are delighted to have you with us today and um, uh, just you know want you to be part of the whole thing. And in, in case any of you have not actually um, been on to this Safe Children, Safe Schools community of practice um, recently, we do have a survey up for a few more days and would love to hear from you. It only takes about 10 minutes and that will really help us stay on track to um, you know, target these events to the things that interest you. So, um, without further ado, um, I, I want to just let you know that um, we will be recording the webinar, and the webinar will then be available later on um, the Gadris YouTube channel. So, um, you can see there, um, there's a link on the Gadris website and um, you'll be able to find all of the webinars there. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Rebecca Firth, uh, who's generously uh, agreed to be our presenter today. She works for a humanitarian open street map, um, which is an international nonprofit community of 200,000 volunteers working to create free open source maps for humanitarian and development projects. Rebecca has been involved in mapping since uh, 2014 when she worked as a volunteer supporting the setup of Missing Maps and since 2016 is a staff member for HOT, Humanitarian, uh, what is it? Open Street Map Team. Open street map team. Um, and uh, Rebecca is based in Peru. So I'm turning this over now to Rebecca. And um, at the end you'll get an opportunity to ask your questions. And we'll be doing a brief poll um, at the very end of um, For those of you who um, are on probably um, uh, anything other than Mac, I think, um, you probably have some interactive features in Skype um, for here. You'll be able to um, pick up a pen and draw on the slides, highlight text, put in check marks or X's and, and put blue arrows um, in. So so when the opportunity arises, um, Rebecca will be guiding you um, in, in that regard. Um, let's see, just um, I think that's it. I just was checking my little uh, checklist here to make sure I hadn't forgotten anything. Over to you, Rebecca. Perfect. Thanks so much for the introduction, Mala, um, and for the invitation um, to speak today. Um, excited to talk to everyone about um, OpenStreetMap and the work we do in Missing Maps. Um, so as um, Mala mentioned, I work for an organization called Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, which I'm going to refer to as HOT throughout this. Um, and we're going to talk through a quick intro on just HOT and what we do. Um, what is the Missing Maps project, um, which um, is obviously, I'm, I'm hoping the reason that people have joined today, um, the steps that we go through when we, when we do mapping, um, a few brief examples of projects, um, and then kind of benefits of joining Missing Maps and the process to do that. Um, and then uh, we'll have obviously a quick poll and some time for any questions. Um, so, in the interest of time, um, a bit of a punchy agenda, so um, we're going to dive in, um, and if people have questions, if you can either save them to the end or type them in the question bot um, section as we go through, and then maybe Molly, you can shout out to me if anything is coming up which, um, which I can't see necessarily while presenting. Sure. Um, so, um, quick intro then, just to get started. I can see there's 19 people on the call, um, and we were wondering where everyone is joining from. Um, so, if you have a um, annotation button, um, for me this is on the top right of the slide, 
Um, and then you can select a, um, a like a highlighter or like an arrow just to say where you're based. Um, so if you have that annotation button, please just mark on the slide right now where you're based, um, where you're joining us from today. Um, and if you aren't able to access the annotation, you can just type that in the chat window. Um, so I'm just putting a little um, arrow on Peru, um, which is where I'm joining in from. So probably slightly different time zone to the uh, people I can see dropping some, some uh, arrows on Indonesia right now. Um, so we're going to use this functionality again just a tiny bit later, um, just for a brief question. Um, so this is your chance to practice. Brilliant. Okay, wow, I can see in the chat we have people from Nepal, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Thailand, India. So um, real uh, spanning a lot of places right now, which is great. Um, so uh, moving on then. Um, so quick intro to HOT. Um, so uh, this is our mission statement, um, which is essentially that we envision a world where everyone is counted, so everyone is added to the map. Um, data is accessible and used, so anyone can um, use the data that's added to the map um, right through from individuals themselves from those communities through to people making decisions that might affect those communities. Um, and everyone can engage and contribute. Um, so it's really important to us that anyone can be a mapper. Um, so as we'll kind of show through the examples that we go through, um, we think of mapping as something that kind of should be open to anyone to do um, and really want it to be a community-led activity. Um, and this mission is something that is um, enacted by our staff team um, and our community of 200,000 volunteers. Um, so spanning kind of most countries um, and kind of obviously in some places much more volunteers than others, um, but in many of the locations people have um, mentioned just here that they're based, um, there is uh, a lot of volunteers. So I'm um, hoping that I might also be able to connect you with um, local uh, volunteer groups um, as well after the call. Um, so a quick recap, um, this slide is actually um, just a few uh, a few weeks out of date now. Um, so we're just approaching 200,000 volunteers. Uh, we've mapped an area home to 80 million people. Um, our data has been downloaded and used by humanitarians 34,000 times, and we're aiming to map 1 billion people by 2021. Um, so that's the kind of um, snapshot view. Um, what does that uh, mean in the context of the project we're talking about, which is missing maps? Um, so the organization I work for, HOT, um, who I've been talking about so far on the webinar, um, in 2014 um, built a project called The Missing Maps with um, the four organizations listed at the top here. So American Red Cross, British Red Cross, uh, Medicine Song Frontier and HOT um, came together to create um, The Missing Maps project. Um, and Missing Maps is essentially an open collaborative um, project, which um, has 18 members presently, but um, always growing. Um, and it's open to NGOs, um, research institutions, and civil society organizations who are interested in creating humanitarian um, or development data um, and need more maps um, for their field programs. Um, so, in a way, it is um, kind of uh, an opportunity, I guess, for organizations to tap into this global network of volunteers and tools, uh, which I'm about to talk you through, which are kind of all free and open um, and can help to address perhaps some of the mapping or data needs that you have um, through volunteering. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit through the mapping process just so you can get your head around like what is it, what are the tools involved, etc. Um, but also happy to take questions if um, people have them. Um, so step one, um, we think of mapping as a three-step process. So the first step is using a satellite image. Um, individuals will draw buildings and roads. Um, so volunteers um, anywhere in the world can, can draw these um, uh, kind of uh, structures, I guess, um, in, into OpenStreetMap. And so OpenStreetMap is an open and free um, mapping platform. 
Um, and the types of images people see are as simple as the one on the screen. So just one little square and draw around um, what, what it is um, that you see. Um, so that's the stage that's done remotely by volunteers. Um, many missing maps organizations have um, big volunteer communities already. Um, they also might do this with um, their corporate partners or public um, events to try to kind of crowdsource um, that stage. Um, and this is just an example of like a mapathon, which is a big group event where people come together to um, volunteer. Um, so then the second stage is adding extra detail to that map in um, the country that you're creating it in. Um, so uh, apologies, this example here is in Spanish, um, but this on the right hand side of the screen is a um, just a screenshot of an app, a map that we an app that we use called Open Map Kit, um, and essentially using this, people are able to use the base map we saw um, in the first step to walk around an area and add extra detail. So that detail can be um, anything from health centers to street names to clinics, kind of physical information, through to doing um, surveys, um, information on social or demographics, um, really anything you can add to the map. It is just geotagged um, data, um, but we tend to do it through either through adding features on a mapping app or doing surveys with a tool like Open Map Kit. Um, in this step, obviously, I guess a lot of people are thinking, you know, where's the data? Who owns it? Um, where is it stored? Um, so the data, um, physical map data, is all stored in OpenStreetMap, where it's openly licensed for anyone to use. Um, and that, by physical information, I mean, um, you know, the geography, as it were. So building material, um, if a building has electricity or water supply, um, identifying places which um, at could be evacuation points like sports pitches um, and then um, there is a whole bunch of other data we can get like social data on demographics um, uh, census information for example we do often mini censuses and obviously that contains private data that we don't want to share um, so that would be stored on a specific um, server which is either set up by the partner or, or by us dedicated to a project um, but that would be private and not accessible for other people um, online. Um, so step three in the process um, is people actually use the data. Um, so I'm going to show you two quick examples of this. Um, so this one is an example from the Netherlands Red Cross, um, who are doing a forecast-based financing program with the IFRC. Um, and it shows how kind of um, an expert, um, a GIS uh, call, uh, resource, for example, in their team can take the base map that we create overlay a bunch of other data, like a forecast, and produce um, something that someone can use to take a decision. So this map shows you, um, this was actually right after Cyclone Idai in Mozambique, um, and it shows you um, where are the places that are going to be affected so that people can actually make decisions. So this is an example of how those maps can be useful for a, um, a kind of, you know, JS thing expert. However, um, there is also other options like this is community workshops um, so also something we often do with maps is um, we create the map and then we use it to um, identify flood risk in a community or have discussions with community members about safe spaces um, have discussions with communities about um, adaptive um, capacity and kind of community strengths um, and so there is, um, obviously, you can see this kind of quite a different articulation of, of that map, which is people actually talking about the place that they live and identifying um, certain things that are going to help to improve the, the situation. Um, so with those, um, that process in mind, I'm just going to touch on really quickly um, four quick examples, which are going to show how the um, variety of what we do 
um, with mapping can be um, relevant to uh, different aspects of work. So um, hopefully some of these are going to touch on projects that you maybe work on um, or you can see how they might apply. Um, if not, then um, also feel free to send me um, information on that, your specific context and I can see if we have any other examples which might be um, a close fit. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk quickly about is um, a community-based disaster risk reduction. Um, so this is a project we have in Tanzania, and um, essentially this is open mapping for community flood resilience. So we train community members, like the people in this photo, who live in the places that we're working, to map historical flood extents. Um, how do you do that? Obviously, it can sound really complicated. Um, so you use the simple apps that we um, that we have. Um, community members are actually far more likely to get accurate data than people external to that community because they have a really strong idea of what's happened in that place in the past. Um, and they're able to do really, really simple mapping, like going to different households and asking, you know, was this flood up to your ankle or your knee or your waist? Um, asking questions in kind of terminology that anyone would understand. Uh, mapping adaptive capacity, so understanding community strengths and advantages um, and ways that that community can adapt to um, flooding, which is a very um, regular occurrence in um, where this project is based in, in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam. Um, and as I mentioned, asking highly adapted questions. Um, this is actually also a photo from a workshop. Um, work done there to understand kind of flood extents and how we can best um, improve drainage to um, to help those um, those issues. So a second example, um, this one's from Indonesia, um, a critical infrastructure mapping program. Um, this was done with the goal of mapping um, baseline infrastructure. Um, so that um, the uh, disaster management agency and the government had better data to take decisions around um, events of different sizes. Um, so this build, this program mapped one and a half million buildings in five months um, and surveyed 25,000 um, infrastructures. Um, in, that was in Jakarta and in Semarang, half a million buildings and 11,000 um, infrastructures um, and really, really detailed information at times. So, you know, um, where is this hospital? How many floors does it have? How many beds does it have? What are the opening hours? So that, say, if a flood took out um, the access to that hospital, you would be able to understand the impact. Um, and this all plugs into um, a tool called InnerSafe, which you may be familiar with, um, but which offers really, really advanced analytics around um, how uh, a certain flood event um, or disaster might affect um, the infrastructure in a, a location. Um, also, maps are used for things like planning evacuation routes, mapping with disabled communities to plan evacuation routes um, that might vary according to kind of population um, and um, identifying shelters and points of, uh, of safety. Um, third really quick example, so we also do some work in disaster response. Um, this uh, image on the right is meant to be a GIF, but I'm not sure if that's working right now. Um, but if it was working, it would show you loads of mapping edits adding to being added to the map all at once. Um, so this is just a quick example from after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, where about five and a half thousand volunteers mapped one and a half million volunteer uh, buildings in just three months. Um, so immediately after the disaster. Um, and those were used for all sorts of different reasons, which are mentioned on the slide. Um, but just to share that disaster response mapping is also something that remote volunteers often participate in. So if there's a disaster in an area that there is not a good or an up-to-date base map, um, then updating that um, and also adding uh, additional local information if there is a local mapping community available and they have time and resources to to contribute, which often is not the case in a um, in a disaster. So um, obviously that stage of field validation doesn't always happen, but is something we uh, always try to support if we can. 
Um, then sharing just an education example from um, a project where I'm based in Cusco, Peru. Um, this is kind of a different example to the previous ones because this is actually really focused on how do we engage high school children in mapping. Um, so whereas the other ones are actually more focused on a specific um, problem like um, DRR, this project is really focused on how do we um, engage um, students as um, protagonists and map data creators. Um, so this program is um, yeah, set in the context where about 12% of children achieve a satisfactory level in literacy um, regionally. Um, in rural areas that can be 0% and often a little bit higher in the cities. Um, very affected by a lot of disaster, natural disasters, so um, Peru has a high level in nine of the 11 um, types of natural disaster defined by the World Bank. Um, and what this project does is work with high school children to map um, gendered problems that affect their daily lives um, and the students actually choose what it is they're going to map. So they work in small teams and they create, um, create mini projects in their local area. Um, one question that kind of comes in here often is around data ethics. Um, so, you know, kids adding data around gender to the map, like is that, um, you know, is that, um, how does that work? Um, so just um, to quickly cover that off, um, obviously the, the data isn't um, generally um, immediately public to others, but a lot of the time the data is actually not sensitive. Um, so an example of data that would be private would be data around um, violence versus an example of data that would be public would be there's one project here around um, sexist marketing um, that children might encounter on the way to school. Um, so obviously we make a judgment call depending on the project what data would be open versus closed. Um, additionally, the students themselves are the ones creating the data. Um, and generally, um, you know, this isn't a project where, say, someone else is going to get data from this community and then use it for purposes that the community might not understand. Um, like, rather than kind of, we often talk about rather than being mapped by others, these students are mapping themselves. Um, and so um, ethical considerations around, um, around that, like generally we feel that that's actually much more ethical than um, more kind of extractive data um, processes because the communities actually understand what what is this data because they created it themselves. Why have I created it? Because there was a really clear reason why they did that. Um, and what will it be used for? Um, and it's really important, I think, that we have those aspects as part of every project, along with, where possible, also advocacy training so that communities also understand how they can use their own data, um, rather than data always being something that is used by um, kind of other um, populations to make decisions about them. It should be data that they can also access and, um, and use. Um, here's just a couple of really quick examples so you can see the types of um, data that people might create because um, I know when I spoke um, previously about a couple of the Save to the Children employees, kind of community mapping um, was a really key example. So um, these are really simple examples of um, where, how students can create maps of um, things in their own communities. This one is a map of where are the rubbish bins in this area versus where is the waste that's on the street. So you can see here, obviously, you have um, loads of bins here um, where these dots are, and then here you have loads of rubbish, and you know those bins are not where all the rubbish is, um, so that would be one way to solve that problem. Um, and this is an example of um, sexist marketing that um, children um, would encounter on their way to school. So this is one um, group of children, uh, for children's um, journeys to school and the marketing that they see. Um, so as I said, like those examples aren't really related to DRR, but they are um, kind of uh, examples of how we've engaged young people in creating the data about themselves. So um, I thought they might be useful to share. Um, just um, conscious on time, we're going to cover off really quickly now 
just a couple of the benefits of joining the Missing Maps partnership um, and then the process. Um, and then I'll hand back um, to Marla for the panel, uh, for the, um, the poll um, and any questions that we might have. Um, so really quickly, anyone who has access to the um, annotation um, button, um, please uh, put a little arrow mark next to one of these four options. These are the four, four of the um, most kind of obvious benefits of joining Missing Maps. And one thing I thought would be really interesting was just to understand do people have preferences? What is the reason that people might be interested in joining from the examples that we, we gave? Um, what is it that people are looking for? Um, and again, as before, if you can't annotate the slide, um, then also feel free to leave a quick comment in the IM um, in the chat window. Um, so the four benefits that we've um, got here are free maps quickly. Do you need data for your projects? Um, advice and experience of other members. Um, so working with other um, mapping groups um, and, and learning from their projects. Um, the tools, so free tools for field deployments. Um, are you interested in um, uh, having access to the tool suite that we have and, and being able to use that? Um, and engaging volunteers, um, so either your existing volunteer community or your own. Um, so if any of those are particularly interesting to you, um, please comment in the um, in the window or pop a little arrow. I can see a few coming up already, um, so that we um, know, you know, why is it that people are interested and how can we help um, better answer your questions around that. Uh, so I can see a couple here coming in around free maps and tools for field deployment. Um, a few arrows, also free maps will be coming up the highest right now. Um, incorporating into risk reduction programming, of course. Um, so don't be shy, everybody. Think about how, I mean, I'm sure, I know some of you from the Philippines are looking at that, uh, the solid waste management things that, you know, relate very much to the kind of work that some of you have done. Which examples did you guys, uh, do you relate to? Or what's coming to mind? Um, I can see a quick question here, actually, um, on can maps be loaded offline and data entered offline? Um, so yeah, simply put, um, in some of the apps, then yeah, the data is um, created and then it can be downloaded and used offline. Um, and then with several of the surveying um, tools, then you can create data offline and then when you get to a place of connection, upload all that data all at once. Um, we have quite a lot of tools in the tool suite, um, there's about 10. Um, and so generally the tools that people will use depend a little bit on the context, why they're wanting to create the data, what functionality do they need. Not all of them work offline, like the desktop mapping that does not work offline because people need to have access to satellite imagery. Um, but say um, downloading the map that was created with that imagery, using it for navigation or adding um, or surveying or something, um, definitely. Um, we also have some super low, low resource um, options. So whereas some of them, maybe you need a slightly um, higher quality smartphone, you need to be online. Um, the solutions go right through to things that will work on a smart on a thirty dollars smartphone offline. Things that will work on paper and can later be transferred online. Um, so it's really designed to kind of fit with the variety of. Um, the variety of um, kind of resources that um, that different communities um, and projects are going to have. Um, okay, so I'm just going to um, whiz through next um, quickly the process on um, joining missing maps. Um, essentially, if people are interested in learning more or um, kind of understanding um, a bit about the partnership, then um, in kind of specific detail, then I'm really happy to go through those questions. Um, but if people are interested to participate, 
Um, we have uh, a generally a pretty simple joining process. I'm going to talk through it just now. Um, so the first one is obviously people learn about missing maps. Um, so for many people, this might be the um, your opportunity to do that right now. Um, then have some kind of internal discussion. So why is it that you want to join? What sort of resource do you plan to put into it? Are you going to have a staff team working on it? Are you going to have um, a volunteer working on it? Are you going to have one person kind of part-time? How, how is it that you would want to integrate this into your programming and help your projects? Is that is that small scale or large scale? Um, do you need a grant to do it? Can it, can it um, go within someone's existing role? Um, by way of context within the existing members, there are teams, uh, there is a huge variation from teams which maybe have five people working full time on missing maps through to teams which don't have anyone working on missing maps and they have a really light touch engagement where maybe someone joins um, our catch up calls and keeps up to date with what other people are doing and maybe does a small kind of project every few months. But, um, really kind of all scales of engagement and we're definitely open to all of that. Then when you decide you want to join, then you write a letter of intent to the membership. Um, so that letter of intent basically explains why do we want to join, like how is this going to help our work. Um, often that has a very close tie to kind of what data do we need, like most members, I mean, all members of Missing Maps are like operational data users. So how is this tool going to help us? And also kind of, you know, how do we intend to participate in the partnership? What is it that we, you know, what are the key activities we might be able to um, to help on? Um, generally, an existing member will also help you with that letter if you like. So reviewing the draft or um, having a call around specifics um, ahead of time. It's a pretty collaborative partnership. Um, then that letter gets sent to the members um, and there's a month um, of time during which people are able to come up with questions um, to ask to you. Um, so then there is either kind of those questions sent by email or there's an intro call um, where maybe we cover some of them off. Um, always, I mean, those are, those are usually sort of fact finding. So wanting to understand is there overlap with existing members and kind of shared um, locations or topics that we're working on that we might be able to collaborate with, um, specific questions around, I don't know if you have a certain plan and someone has done a very similar project before, they might have some advice to offer. Um, so generally those questions are about kind of execution and, um, you know, uh, ways that we can kind of better learn from what each other has done before. Um, then if um, after that stage, people are accepted into the membership and they sign an MOU. Um, that MOU is a three-year um, document, but obviously it can be, can be terminated, but um, it's an agreement which talks about um, the Missing Maps partnership and what the objectives and ethics are behind it. Um, and then it um, outlines our ways of working. So it says, you know, how do we make decisions as a group? Um, how do we apply for funding? How do we um, use the branding? Really, really simple uh, logistical things. It's kind of a how-to document to introduce you. Um, and then you follow an onboarding process, which is basically just a checklist of steps you go through with an existing member to make sure that you're um, you know, fully up to speed on um, the partnership and how to participate. Um, so if anyone is interested in joining, um, I thought it would be helpful just to outline that process so that um, there's a clear kind of understanding of, of, of how it works. Um, but um, I think I'm roughly on schedule um, and I'm going to hand back to Mala now um, to ask if we do the poll first or we do, um, or if we go to questions. We'll do the questions so, first, thanks. Okay. Thanks so Perfect. much, uh, Rebecca. We really appreciate it. Um, don't don't go back on mute quite yet because I have a feeling we'll, we'll have some questions. Why don't we um, go ahead and take um, uh, three or four questions right away, and then and then um, we can turn it back over to Rebecca to answer any questions. Anything come to mind for any of us? I actually have a couple of questions. Um, you've kind of answered, I think, one of them, but I just want to confirm, um, which is um, 
you know, who who owns the data and how the data is is managed in terms of the, the difference between data that, that is um, to the volunteers or to the public and data that is available, you know, that may be more sensitive or private and how that's protected. Yeah, um, so yeah, as, um, as we kind of lightly touched on, um, the data is owned itself by, um, uh, by kind of the community, the OpenStreetMap community. So it's public data, which is um, under a um, ODBL um, license. Um, there's a lot of information um, about that here. So for anyone who's a kind of data nut, you can check out this wiki. Um, and there's loads of information about that and how we apply, comply with GDPR and all sorts of um, different kind of rules. Um, in terms of um, the data um, ownership, again, as the data is created by the community, we often also talk about like the community being kind of like the guardians and the stewards of that data. Um, even though I realize that isn't always kind of in a legal sense, um, they're kind of viewed very much as the owners of their own data within OpenStreetMap and missing maps and all of the ways that, um, uh, that, that those um, groups work together. Um, okay, we have some more questions. I, I want. I don't want to monopolize, so let me take these in order here. Can we transfer um, missing map um, with existing government GIS data? Can can that data be overlaid um, and brought into the the uh, you know into layers in in the process? That's one question. Um, and there's another question about. Do we have an overview of what's being mapped? And I suppose that's another question about, you know, how layers function, for example. Um, and um, and then we'll go on to another set of questions about what happens in other countries, in different countries. Yeah. So um, to go, I'll go in order then. So the first one: Can you transfer that data with existing data sets? Um, so you have two options here. So the first one is you download the um, data we have in OpenStreetMap, and then you upload it into another system to use. Um, there's two tools that you can use to do that. Um, I'm just copying the links in here. Um, so you can either um, using uh, the Humanitarian Data Exchange or using um, an export tool we've built download basically any format of data in any place. Um, and then you can push that into another system and use it. Or if the data you're using is openly licensed, you can import that into OpenStreetMap and then work from there. So um, for example, if you have um, one, uh, we recently did a, uh, a project um, importing um, boundaries um, in, in a particular location. So we got that data from the government. It was openly licensed. We imported all those boundaries into OSM. And then when we did our project in that place, we could use that as the base map. Um, so you have kind of two ways to, um, to go with that. Um, the second question, do we have an overview of what's being mapped? Um, so if you are setting mapping projects, um, either on the hot tasking manager, which is the tool we use for remote mapping, um, then you can log into this, uh, to that tool and you're going to see, um, basically these areas that people have said, we want this place to be mapped. So as the creator of the mapping task, you say, Hey, this is the area I want. Um, and then you can see progress as that's mapped and also validated. Um, with the field data, um, there's actually other ways. Um, there's another tool called Map Campaigner you can do to say, you know, if I want to um, do a mapping campaign on every hospital in this region um, and then see progress against that. Um, and on both of those tools, you can also see like who's contributing the most. Is it, say, a project where you've engaged your own staff to do it and you actually know all of the contributors? Is it an open community project um, when maybe you might not know all of the usernames, but you definitely want to know participation levels? Um, there's a big, wide uh, variety there. Um, and then I see this third question on, um, is it the same app we would use in different countries? 
Um, so yeah, we do tend to change, um, not according to the country, but according to the context. So you know, where is the project happening? What resources are available in that project, in, in, that, in that country? Um, and what is the data we're collecting? So say some data you might want to collect with a, just a GPS reference, whereas other data you might want to collect um, attached to a specific building. Um, so on our website, there's also a link which talks through the key tools that we do use, which are um, uh, each listed on the brief, ex brief description. So you can also just check out um, those tools and also link to them um, there. There are a few others, um, but these are the kind of key tools that are part of the, the mapping flow. Um, and as I should mention, like most of these tools are open source and are um, contributed to by quite a wide variety of contributors. Um, some of them are hosted by HOT, some of them are hosted by our partners. Um, and so because of that, obviously, there aren't kind of costs to use them. And they are um, kind of things that perhaps people can get updates if you need a certain new feature or functionality in a tool. You can get that made without having to necessarily fund it yourself if there's a community of volunteers that um, you can suggest kind of this is the information we need, this is why we need it, and they may well um, create it for you. That happens quite a lot. Um, and it's obviously one of the benefits of joining a kind of open source um, community volunteer based um, group. Um, so there was also another question saying, can it be integrated into local or national data system? Um, so we have some specific projects um, which also have done this, which um, I can share more details with you um, individually. Um, and but in a sense, um, yes, and it happens um, either through the process I discussed, where you know our data is put into another um, system, or through the process where um, other data is put into the OSM um, system. Um, and there are a number of projects we've done, say, um, with uh, local government ministries um, who need data um, on particular topics. Um, specific examples of that include disaster management and planning um, and um, waste removal. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there are definitely things that can be done, but it of, of, often requires um, obviously like national or local government um, uh, to kind of drive that. Um, I can see another question in here on feedback from users and safety issues when used by children. Um, so yeah, as um, to, to go through the safety issues one, um, there is um, kind of specific apps that we'd re we would use when doing that, um, when mapping with children. Um, and those maps don't include like typical safeguarding concerns, like um, there's no private messaging availability or there's no way for like one mapper to contact another mapper for example um, so there is kind of none of the I guess the key uh, like safeguarding risks um, that would come to mind first up um, however also because um, generally the group that is engaging that group of children to map will be doing that with quite a specific purpose they'll also have access to um, quite specific um, features. So they'll be doing, say, a survey on a specific topic, which has been already checked to ensure that it doesn't include like safeguarding issues. Um, or say, if children are going to be mapping in spaces that um, might be unsafe. So say we've done um, mapping of um, violence in public spaces, that would always be um, accompanied by um, an adult. But obviously, these are all projects which are run according to each individual member organization's safeguarding processes, which in the case of obviously um, the types of organizations included on this call are pretty um, have pretty robust um, safeguarding processes. Um, Those are great. These are great, um, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, just to keep on on really strict timetable, I just want to see if there's any other last question anybody wants to squeeze in. Because otherwise, we're going to go quickly to a feedback, a bit of a feedback session. Um, I have.
have one other um, question regarding the quality of the um, map imagery in different countries. Um, I understand that there might be some countries where um, I'm not sure why, if government sort of manages to block things or 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 scramble or something, where the imagery might not be as as um, as we would get looking at your examples. Yeah, sorry, the connection broke up ever so slightly there. I just wanted to check I heard you properly. It was how do we do this if we don't get um, if we don't have up to date imagery? No, the question is, are, do some countries um, block the quality of imagery that's available in the country? Uh, yeah. Um, so generally, the imagery we get is from a variety of satellite partners, um, Digital Globe um, or Maxa, um, Bing and Esri um, are some of the kind of biggest providers that we actually get satellite imagery from 11 providers. Um, and they generally aren't, um, it's not like, uh, rather than from, say, like country space agencies, um, which means that those kind of political um, aspects um, generally do do not apply. Uh, one challenge we do often have is, say, imagery might be out of date or maybe there's cloud covering the imagery that we do have, um, which is why it's really helpful that we have access to imagery from a lot of different sources. Um, so if you log into OpenStreetMap, you actually you'll see when you map a little option just to change the imagery. Um, that you're mapping from. Um, so you can see kind of the number of sources. Um, another option we have is we can capture, we, we do have um, tools to help people kind of capture drone imagery in a place and then upload that to make mapping projects, um, which might work if there's kind of local capacity to do that. Fantastic. Um, Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I, I have a feeling this has mostly, um, you know, provoked a lot of interest and a lot of um, trips to the um, HOT website um, as, as we look into this more. I'm going to... Perfect. Thanks so much from my side for everyone for joining. Um, and please check out um, the, the links I posted um, for more information um, or send me over any questions. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining.